Hi friends and welcome to our Acids and Bases unit. And before we dig in, let's go out to the course organization presentation and see where we are in the overall structure of our year. So remember that our overall theme for the year is that matter is made of atoms that interact in interesting ways. And here in the last part of our course, we're looking at four different specific cases of interesting chemistry. Unit 10 dealt with solutions. And now here in unit 11, we're gonna be looking at acids and bases. We're gonna deal with topics like acid-base theories, neutralization reactions, and pH. Sound good? I hope so. All right, let's go take a look. So our first lesson in acids and bases is going to look at the erroneous definition of acids and bases, what they are, how they work, and some of their properties. Here's the man himself, Svante Arrhenius, and he came up with the definition. According to Arrhenius, acids are substances that dissociate to produce H plus ions, which we would call protons in solution, and bases are substances that dissociate to produce OH minus ions, which are hydroxide ions in solution. As a result, acids and bases are examples of what we'd call electrolytes, which is any substance that conducts electricity when it's dissolved in solution. This is acids, bases, and soluble ionic compounds, which are called salts. So this notion of an electrolyte is kind of interesting. Here's ethanol, which is not an electrolyte, and you can see that the light bulb does not go on when we run an electrical current through ethanol because nothing can conduct the current through the solution. We can have highly conductive electrolytes, so this is KCl, which dissociates into charged ions, which can conduct the electrical current through the solution, and so as a result, the bulb is very bright. And we can have weak electrolytes. So this is, for instance, acetic acid, which doesn't produce a lot of protons in solution. And so as a result, there's less of a concentration of ions and it conducts electricity less than something like KCl does. So we're gonna start by talking about acids. And so Arrhenius acids are covalent electrolytes. They're actually really the only covalent electrolytes that you need to be familiar with. And this is because the acid dissociates. So here we can see HCl breaking apart into its H plus ion and its Cl minus ion. What's gonna happen with that H plus ion is that it's going to associate with an H2O molecule, a water molecule, via a coordinate covalent bond. So oxygen in a water molecule has two unshared pairs of electrons and that proton is looking for two electrons, so it's going to attach on to a water molecule. This is going to make an H3O plus ion or a hydronium ion. Here's what this looks like. We go from H2O plus the proton to produce H3O plus. The bottom line that you really need to be familiar with for the purpose of our discussion is that in water, the concentration of H plus is equal to the concentration of H3O plus. Protons do not exist by themselves in water. They're always attached to water molecules via these coordinate covalent bonds. These are the same thing, they'll be used interchangeably, and so you really do need to get used to the notion that in water solutions, aqueous solutions, H plus and H3O plus are the same thing. Let's talk about some properties of Arrhenius acids. The first property that we should be aware of is that acids corrode active metals. And so if we look at reference table J, which is the activity series, we see a list of active metals. Any metal that's more active than H2, and you can see H2 over on the metal side, provided as a reference, will be oxidized by an Arrhenius acid. So if we put an Arrhenius acid into contact with any of those metals that are above H2 on reference table J, they will react, the metal will be oxidized, and H2 will be produced from the Arrhenius acid. Our second property of Arrhenius acids is that they have a pH less than 7. We'll talk about what pH means a little bit later, but for right now, all you need to know is that pH is a measurement of the concentration of H3O plus ions, and the lower we go, the more concentrated that gets. You should also understand the pH scale is a logarithmic scale, and so each decrease of one on the pH scale is a 10 times increase in H3O+. Our third property of Arrhenius acids is that they taste sour. Now let's pause for a second and have a safe chemistry discussion. You should never, ever, ever taste laboratory-grade acids. At the same time, vinegar, citric acid, these are examples of acids that you may have tasted, and you probably agree that they taste sour. Now that we have a handle on some of the properties of Arrhenius acids, let's talk about how we name them. We have a reference table with common acids, that's reference table K, and you can see a lot of the acids that you'll see in this course are named over there, but you do need to be able to name acids that are not on there. For binary acids, it's pretty easy. Put the prefix hydro in front of it, then you take the name of the anion, the thing that the H plus is attached to, and then you end it with ic acid. You can see this over on reference table K with HCl. HCl is a binary acid, it's made out of two atoms, and so it's hydrochloric acid. 
Make sense? Ternary acids get a little bit funkier, but it's not too bad. We're really interested in the polyatomic ion's name. If the polyatomic ion's name ends in A-T-E, then that acid's name is going to be the polyatomic ion ic acid. We don't start with hydro. Similarly, if the polyatomic ion's name ends in I-T-E, then that acid's name is going to be the polyatomic ion us acid. And again, we do not start with hydro. That would only be for binary acids. You can see this over on reference table K. We've got HNO2 and HNO3. NO3 is nitrate, and so the name of that acid is nitric acid. NO2 is nitrite, and so the name of that acid is nitrous acid. Does this make sense? Let's see if we can do it. I'd like you to practice by trying to name these acids. Pause the video, try it on your own, and then when you're ready, we'll go through it together. So HBr is a binary acid, and so its name is hydrobromic acid. By the same token, H2S is also a binary acid, and so its name is hydrosulfuric acid. HNO2 is a ternary acid. NO2 is nitrite, and so as a result, that's nitrous acid. HClO3 is a ternary acid. ClO3 is chlorate, and so this is chloric acid. And finally, ClO2 is chlorite, and so this is chlorous acid. Does this make sense? If it doesn't, write down any questions that you have before we move on to talk about bases. Arrhenius bases are ionic compounds. They're always going to consist of a metal cation and a hydroxide anion. Here's an example, NaOH. You can see that when we put it into water, it breaks apart into Na plus ions and OH minus ions. We should also pause and note that for simplicity's sake, I've just shown one formula unit of NaOH, but in reality, it exists in a big network structure like any ionic compound. In terms of the properties of Arrhenius bases, they're a little bit different than acids, but there's still things that we need to be aware of. The first property is that Arrhenius bases are caustic. They will corrode metals, but they're also dangerous for us to touch because caustic chemicals are those that can hydrolyze the fats that we're made out of. We don't want that to happen too much. And so you might see a warning like this on a base cabinet. It just means to be careful and make sure that you wear proper clothing protection. Of course, the caustic nature of bases is also what leads to the production of soap, which is a very, very useful cleaning compound, and we'll discuss how that works later on in our organic chemistry unit. But the production of soap is due entirely to the caustic nature of Arrhenius bases. In terms of pH, Arrhenius bases have a pH greater than 7. Any solution with a pH above 7 is going to have more hydroxide ions in it than hydronium ions. And of course, remember that each increase of one on the pH scale is a 10 times increase in the concentration of hydroxide ions. In terms of taste, Arrhenius bases taste bitter. Now, of course, again, do not taste the laboratory grade bases that we're going to be using in class. At the same time, I couldn't really easily find pictures of bitter tasting substances that are due to the fact that they're basic. You can read about them on the internet if you want, but I found conflicting information, so I couldn't find a picture for you. If you do find one, leave it in the comments below the video. It'd be interesting to see. In terms of naming bases, it's nowhere near as difficult. Common bases are listed on reference table L, and for Arrhenius bases, it's always going to be the name of the metal followed by hydroxide. So sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, calcium hydroxide, you get the point. As we end, let's talk about how we can tell the difference between acids and bases. We're really going to use indicators for that more than anything else. An indicator is a colored chemical or a pigment that changes color as the pH of the solution changes. So as we move between different pH values, a particular indicator will change different colors. This diagram shows a whole bunch of different indicators over a whole bunch of different pH ranges and the colors that they change as a result. And you can see that we have a wide variety of different pigments that change different colors over different ranges. You're going to need to be familiar with the indicators that are listed on reference table M. And so reference table M has six different indicators. It's got their range for the color change and the color changes that they change as a result. So for methyl orange, for instance, it's active from a pH of 3.1 over to 4.4. Below a pH of 3.1, it is red. Above a pH of 4.4, it is yellow. And in between its range, it's changing color and it will look orange to us. Using similar logic, we can see litmus, for instance, is red at a pH below 4.5 and blue at a pH above 8.3. And inside of its range, its color is changing and it's going to look purple to us. Does that make sense? If it doesn't, write down any questions that you have before we wrap up. Thanks so much for watching our discussion of Arrhenius acids and bases. Make sure you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure you can use the Arrhenius definition to identify acids and bases. Make sure that you can use the properties of a substance to determine if it's an Arrhenius acid, an Arrhenius base, or neither. Make sure that you can name Arrhenius acids. 
And finally, make sure that you can use reference table M to determine the color of an indicator at a particular pH. If you can do all of those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down any questions that you have. You can always leave them in the comments below the video and you can always get in touch with me. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.